I was going to do it, but he showed up. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce this next gentleman to you. He's going to thrill you, young and old alike, from Yazoo City, Mississippi, and the Grand Ole Opry, way out town in Tennessee, Jerry Clower. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> closest post office in rural America. My roots come from the Carolinas. Years ago, a ship landed in Charleston, and on that ship, they had some refugees from Germany. The name was Clower, K-L-A-U-E-R, Clower. Now, when they got to this country, they kept pronouncing it the same, Clower, but they changed it to C-L-O-W-E-R. And they all took off west. And they got to southwest Mississippi. They put up a big sign. We're going to organize Liberty, Mississippi. Stop him. And all of it could read, stop. <laughs> and all of it couldn't read, went on and organized Liberty, Texas. <laughs> That's the truth. So as I speak to you, I'm building me a house back on the old home place, Route 4, Liberty, Mississippi. And me and Mama's going to move back down there when my daughter gets out of high school the 30th of this month. We're going back to our roots. Everything evolved around an old country store when I was growing up. If you'd hunt somebody and couldn't find them, you'd go to the store and say, where is Marcel? Said, he's hunting. Where is Mrs. Ice Newman? He went to pay his taxes. One day I was sitting at that country store and Marcel had better been bird hunting all day. It's quail season. And Marcel come walking in that store and about four o'clock in the afternoon and old man Duval Scott, the man that runs the store, said, Marcel, did you kill any birds? Said, I killed 16. Man sitting over there on a cracker barrel said, I bet you shot them sitting on the ground. Marcel said, Can they fly? <laughs> Me and Marcel are sitting in front of that store one day, and a city fella drove up in a big old long car. Got out and looked at us, said, Hey, country boy, said, If one of y'all can eat that watermelon right there, I'll give you five dollars. Watermelon must have weighed 65 pounds. Marcel got up and run his bare foot over the top of that watermelon. Oh! Woo, $5. I believe I can eat that thing for $5. We haven't seen $5 in our life. Marcel said, I'll be right back. He broke and run up to his house and come back about 15 minutes, squatted down over that watermelon, busted it, commenced to reach it in there and eat it and spit the seeds out, scraped the rind, sucked the juice, wiped his mouth, said, give him a five dollars. Man said, you sure did uh, eat the watermelon and I got you five dollars. But tell me, what'd you run up to that house for before you eat the watermelon? Marcel said, real simple, said, my daddy had a watermelon up there under the bed he was saving for seed and it was the same size of this one. And I knowed if I could eat that, and I could eat this one. <laughs> okay. 
Now, old man Duval Scott, he loved to bet on horse races. Well, ain't no horse racing in Mississippi. All that that they have ain't no betting on it. And what old man Scott would do about three days out of the year, he'd catch a Panama Limited, the main line of Middle America, the Illinois Central Railroad, and he'd ride that thing to New Orleans and bet on them horses. Now, that Panama Limited, that's the fastest train in the world. Whoo, it did it. There's a man stepped on the bottom step of that train one morning and turned around to kiss his mama goodbye and kissed the bull in the mouth at Hammond, Louisiana. <laughs> and when that thing takes off, it takes off. And old man Duval Scott got on that train, went to New Orleans, bet on them horse races, lost his money. And them gamblers said, I'll write a check. We'll take your check. Old man Duval Scott wrote some checks, lost that money. Come on back home, rode that train back to Macomb, Mississippi, went to the bank and stopped payment on them checks he'd give them gamblers. <laughs> and went all over the county bragging about it. <laughs> well, about a week later, here come a big old long black limousine A-model with a Louisiana tag on it. Two fellas sitting up in there looked like Al Capone, hunting Duval Scott. They went to the store and old man Scott hid in the storm pit. Me and Scott said, I don't know where he is. Well, they went to hunting him. They drove over by the Lursey Ledbetter farm. I was over there helping them. We are swapping work. Am I talking over your head? <laughs> See, on the farm, we had jobs of work to do we couldn't do by ourselves, and a neighbor would come and help us, and we'd go help the neighbor just pay back a day's work, and there wouldn't be no money involved. See, it's hard to pull a cross-cut saw by yourself. <laughs> Ma said, let better help me cut stove wood, and I'd help them dig a dug well or bale hay or something. Well, we was plying out a late patch of June corn, and me and Ma Sal Ledbetter was coming out to the end of the road. And them two fellas from New Orleans pulled up and stopped. One of them got out and looked up through the fence and looked at Ma Sal and said, Hey, boy! Ma Sal said, You talking to me? He said, Yeah, I'm talking to you. Ma Sal looked down through the fence at that fella, and that fella said, Hey, where is Duval Scott? Ma Sal said, I don't know. Fella said, them some mighty crooked rows of corn you got there. Marcel said, you can grow as much corn on a crooked row as you can a straight one. Fella said, well, your corn looks mighty yellow. Marcel said, we planted yellow corn. <laughs> Fella said, there ain't much difference between you and a fool, is it? Marcel said, nothing but this fence right here. <laughs> About that time, Uncle Bursley let better come out with his mule. Turning that mule around, that fella said, hey, old man. Uncle Bursley said, you talking to me? He said, yeah, where's Duval Scott? You his best friend. Uncle Bursley said, I don't know. If I did know, I wouldn't tell you. That man reached up in his bosom, took out one of them owl head pistols, thumb cocked it, shot down at Uncle Bursley's feet. Bow! Said, you don't know where Duval Scott is. Let's see if you know how to dance. Bow! And that old man jumping in that dust flying, bow, bow, bow. And Uncle Bursley heard that thing shoot six times. He knew it was empty. He run down on the other side of that old mule, Della, where he had a sawed-off shotgun hanging on the hands <laughs> to shoot birds out of the corn. He grabbed that thing and jumped over that fence, rammed both barrels under that bad fella's chin, and reared him backwards over the hood of that car and thumb-cocked it. <laughs> Put his fingers on both triggers. He said, hey, Mr. Bad Big Shot Gambler from New Orleans. Said, have you ever had the privilege of kissing a 1,500-pound green lip, bad breath, mew, right square dab in the mouth? That fella said, no, sir, but I have always wanted to. <laughs> I don't know of any bunch 
I'd rather be sponsoring me to do a show than the police. I'm on their side. I teach my children to respect the police. I was in a store the other day with my grandson and I heard a woman grab about a five-year-old boy and said, you better shut up. I'll let the police arrest you. And I wanted to vomit. As a woman didn't have guts enough to discipline her children without making a child scared of the police. Isn't that terrible? That's awful. And I teach my children, if you get in trouble, you hunt up a policeman and you tell him the truth. And you're probably guilty. <laughs> but you know my phone number and he'll call me and I'll come face him and we'll reason with him. But we'll do it together. So the fraternal law of the police brought me to town. I know y'all support them and I appreciate you buying a ticket and coming to the show. It's very obvious you ain't a bunch of negative people. Negativism can kill us. We got too many negative talking folks. Yeah, I seen a guy on crossfire last night and he's talking about uh, military and I wanted to say, fella, why don't you to go to the Camp Lejeune in Jacksonville, North Carolina and get up there and tell all them folks that you, you don't think the military is strong. I said, there's enough Marines in Camp Lejeune to kill every Arab in the world over yonder that, that's causing trouble. Them good ones, I ain't including them. I'm talking about them folks what's terrorizing and all that. Hey, y'all, negativism can kill us. This is the greatest country in the world. Them police picked me up today and they gave them and grinning and look. I run into it in my business. I was doing a Grand Ole Opry about a month ago on the Nashville Network, and I got done and done my routine and walked off to the end of the stage and I stood one of them CBS News radio narrators. There he was. <laughs> Had that microphone in his hand. Had that leather strop coming across his shoulder, and you could see that little tape whirling down that between his on that little old thing, that's right. <laughs> And I knew he wanted to interview me and I knew he wanted to talk negative because he was standing there looking like he just got over a hookworm treatment. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Mr. Klawa, a lot of you Grand Ole Opry stars are booked in Europe. But I'm sure if you're booked in Europe, you'll cancel your trip due to the danger of terrorism and Gaddafi. <laughs> I said, sir, I'm what's known as a good old boy. And us good old boys ain't scared of Gaddafi. I said, not only is he a world famous terrorist, but he's a world famous liar. He's got the American people thinking it's more dangerous to fly to Europe than it is to drive through Atlanta. <laughs> And I said, sir, for your information, statistics have proven that one out of 1,400 Americans who travel in this country will be injured. But one out of 700,000 are injured flying to Europe. And by logical deduction, if Delta Airlines will let their captain get on that big old jet and they'll fly that sucker to Europe, old Jerry will go with them and Gaddafi won't keep me from doing nothing I want to do. Well, it shook him up. I was supposed to say, yeah, ain't it awful? Oh, let's cry. <laughs> but he was a pretty good navigator. He regrouped. He said, but Mr. Clower, what if Gaddafi and the terrorists blow up the airplane you are on? I said, I got a home in heaven. So, oh, but Mr. Clower, what if Gaddafi and the terrorists kidnap you? I said, I'll get Jesse Jackson to come get me. <laughs> I love y'all because you ain't a bunch of pessimists. We got a 12-year-old boy in Yazoo City, Mississippi. I wish everybody had his attitude. He wanted to play baseball and there wasn't nobody to play with. And mama said, boy, get out there in the yard and play by yourself. 
Well, little fella got out there in the yard and he took the ball and the bat and he throwed the ball up in the air and he drawed back with the bat and he swung at the ball and he missed it. He throwed the ball up a second time and he drawed back and he missed it. He throwed the ball up a third time and he drawed back and he missed it. And the little fella smiled and he said, gosh, what a pitcher. <laughs> Negativism. Oh, I love positive folks. When that PTL thing busted loose, I was booked down at Carowinds two days later. And them TV navigators was waiting on me in Charlotte. I drove up in that Piedmont jet, walked through that old snout, what? Got out into the airplane depot, and there was two TV navigators. Them lights come on, and one of them said, Mr. Clower, what do you think about the damnable situation at Fort Mill, the PTL scandal? <laughs> I said, sir, I ain't got a dog in that fight. <laughs> he said, oh, sir, surely. You must have some comment. It was talked around here and in the local paper. Had you allowed your name to be placed in nomination, you would have been one of the nominees to have been president of the Southern Baptist Convention. I said, I got a dog in that fight. <laughs> and I said, sir, let me reason with you just for a moment. You are here doing a TV show on some people that you say are not accountable. Well, by logical deduction, why don't you do a piece on some folks that are accountable? I said, come go home with me. My little old church in Yazoo City, Mississippi, we ain't very big, but we got a bunch of storehouse tithers. And we got what we call a 30-10 program. And in the last 10 years, we started 30 brand new churches in pioneer mission areas way out in the far west. And ever first Wednesday night of every month we hand out a mimeograph sheet and it shows every dime we took in and every dime we send out. We are accountable. We'll let you scrooch up that old TV camera and just show that money coming in and going out. You can show it to everybody in the whole world and we'd be glad for you to see that. And and I said, sir, if there are a bunch of folks who claim to be Christians who are accountable, why don't you give us equal time? And I said, not only that, my little old church is associated with 27,000 other churches, and we pool our money, and we give more every day to missions, hospitals, and education that all TV evangelists put together. So do a piece on us. You know what he said? He didn't say nothing. He just started rolling up the walk. <laughs> Negativism. We have a negative barber in my town. I've been working with him for 30 years. You go in his barber shop, the sun's shining bright. Say, pretty day today, ain't it? He said, be raining in an hour. <laughs> if I wasn't a Christian, I'd hire somebody to kill him. <laughs> Ooh, my buddy Bill went in that barber shop, and that old pessimistic barber said, Bill, here, you're going to take a trip. Say, yeah. Uh, I'm going to catch TWA Airlines, I'm going to fly to Rome, and I'm going to visit with the Pope. That old pessimistic barber said, TWA is the sorriest airline in the world. <laughs> They'll lose your suitcase. <laughs> they ain't never on time. If you make it to Rome this time of the year, Rome stinks. <laughs> you ain't going to get to see the Pope. If you see that Pope, you're going to stand down here with 100,000 other people and you're going to hope that Pope walks out on a little old porch way up yonder on the side of the wall. <laughs> Close as you're going to get to him is way down him. 
Well, old Bill is back in the barber shop in about a month, and that old pessimistic barber said, Bill, you didn't take that dumb trip, did you? Bill said, I did, did he? And you lied to me. TWA was a good ally. They didn't lose my suitcase. It's right on time. And flight attendants was friendly. We landed in Rome. I took a whip of Rome. Rome wasn't sticking. You lied about that. But you write about one thing, there was a hundred thousand people all hunkered up together, hoping that that Pope would walk out on that porch up yonder on the side of the wall. And that old pessimistic barber said, you didn't get to see me either, did you, Bill? Said, I did, did he? So while I was standing there hoping that Pope would walk out on that porch, a fella pulled at my sleeve, said, hey, buddy, come with me. The Pope sent me after you. Went around and got on an elevator and Went up four floors and the elevator door open. <laughs> that stood the Pope, and I said, Brother Pope, this is a highlight of my trip, Brother Pope. Getting to see you one on one. That old pessimistic barber said, Bill, why did that Pope pick you out of all them folks and bring you up as an individual? And Bill said, I wondered the same thing. And I asked the Pope why he sent for me. And the Pope said, young man, I wanted to pray with you and counsel with you. Because out of 100,000 people, you undoubtedly got the sorest haircut of anybody I ever saw. North Carolina folks because y'all ain't a bunch of pessimists. I love you because you're working people. You think they put all this industry up and down these roads here because y'all a bunch of lazy folks? I done seen a big old plant today far, wasn't it? Far something, wasn't it? Didn't you pick me up at the airport? Huh? You ain't lost your voice, had you? What was the name of that big knitting mill? Huh? Far, that's right. That's it. Get your mind off them twins now. He got, he got a pair of babies six months old. That's fine. Yeah, and a bunch of people work there. And they ain't gonna put no industry where there's a bunch of lazy folks. And if it is a tradition in America, if you ain't lazy, you'll be respected. And that's a tradition I hope we keep till the Lord calls me home. Now, there's a lot of traditions, especially in the South, don't amount to doodly squat. But them good ones that we do decently and in order, don't be telling me to do away with them. Because I'm a traditionalist, if it's good tradition. I am. If it ain't, do away with it. You know, in the South, it's a tradition to eat grits. Well, there's some folks make fun of us for eating grits. Tell them to shut their mouth. They don't have to eat them. <laughs> they don't like them, don't eat them. I can't fathom folks in the Corn Belt like Iowa and Illinois not eating grits. They grow corn for a living and make fun of us for eating grits. Can you, how dumb can you be? <laughs> If they started eating grits in Iowa per capita like we eat them in the South, corn would go up a dollar a bushel Monday. <laughs> and I love y'all because y'all ain't a bunch of lazy folks. I'm all right, darling. Thank you. Just let it sweat. That's good. That's, that's sweat of your brow. Apostle Paul said, make your living by the sweat of your brow, and I'm sweating. <laughs> let her go. Don't worry about me. Put that right there. I look too much like a diaper. <laughs> that right there. Yeah. I think one of them twins is coming up here. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I was in a Dobbs House restaurant at the airport in Memphis. Had time to eat breakfast one morning before the people come pick me up. And waitress walked up and I said, I want two eggs over light. Sausage, biscuit, and grits. She said, we serve hash browns. 
She wasn't even courteous. I said, lady, I grew up poor. But I never was so poor I had to eat an iced potato for breakfast. <laughs> she said, do you want to see the manager? I said, I sure did. Well, the manager was a lady. She come walking out. I said, what? I saw you on a family feud show. Said, Richard Dawson didn't kiss you. I said, thank God. <laughs> She said, Mr. Clow, the boss, wrote me a memorandum and said, take grits off the menu. I said, let me compliment you on doing what the boss said. Because everybody that works ought to find out who the boss is. And a lot of folks ain't found that out yet. And if you know who your boss is and you're doing what he says, let me compliment you. But you give your boss a message for me. Tell him in a spirit of love, I walked out of him in the deep south trying to change my culture. I said, W.C. Hand is bad on the bank of the Mississippi River. He liable to come out of the grave and kill every one of y'all. <laughs> well, that night I did a show at the Civic Center in Memphis, and the mayor of the town would come backstage to say hello, and he said, Jerry, when we invite industrialists down to West Tennessee, we don't feed them dinner. We feed them breakfast and teach them how to eat grits. I said, don't take them to the Dobbs house at the Memphis Apple. <laughs> he said, they got grits out there. I said, they ain't eating. And that mayor throwed a fit. He got mad. I said, some Yankees done bought the restaurant. <laughs> he said, Jerry, Mr. Dobbs was born and raised in Memphis. His daddy was Hull Dobbs Ford Company, the largest Ford dealer in the world. Good Southerners. I said, well, he's done turned into a scally bag carpet back in Scallywag then if he ain't done took them grits out. Well, that afternoon, I was on WMC radio, and I told this story, and seven, eight good old boys went out of that restaurant and started picking it. That woman manager called me and said, Mr. Clow, if you get off that radio and shut your mouth, I'll put grits back in here for supper. I said, lady, if you ever take them out again, when I come back, I'm going to bring Jerry Reed and Ray Stevens with me. <laughs> it is a tradition in America, if you ain't lazy, you'll be respected. Let me prove it to you. How many of y'all have picked up a hitchhiker? How many of y'all have picked up a hitchhiker? Let me see. All right. How many of y'all ever picked up a hitchhiker that was sitting down or laying down side the road? <laughs> not only do I not pick them up, but I scatter them. <laughs> if they're on a ride with me, they got to get up on their tiptoes ready to chase my car. <laughs> me and my wife was coming up Interstate 55 the other day. Out of Jackson, Mississippi, my wife was with me, and I ride along that talking to her about my grandchildren, and way up yonder, there's two hitchhikers, one laying down side the road with his head on his suitcase hitchhiking, and one sitting down. As soon as my wife saw, <laughs> she started beating on my legs and I hunt you and no, they ain't bothering you. Uh -uh, no. <laughs> Way away from them, I get over here on the shoulder where they see me kicking up that Bermuda grass and that dirt. <laughs> Give them plenty of time to get out of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Working folks, if you lazy, folks talked about you walking in this building tonight. Hey, come, look young. <laughs> Ain't worth killing. Look at that. 
When I grew up, my dearest friend was Marcel Ledbetter. Marcel Ledbetter used to help me cut snow wood. Well, a slow down, sorry, stinking devil sometimes will ride a cross cut saw. You get ready to pull your end, that guy will have a mash down on it. See? You turn it loose with your handle, it'll hit you right on the chin. But not Marcel, he'd hang in that goose. Marcel, that better still a working hand. He's retired from the Navy, but he drives a big old transport truck part time. It hauls these cars. And he hauls these cars all over the world, all over the United States, in one of them big old transport rigs. Marcel was standing at the bus stop in Macomb, Mississippi, to catch the bus to go down to Fernwood to pick up a load of cars. Right in front of him was a girl, female woman. <laughs> Had the latest Pierre Cardin skirt for women on. Real tight around the waist and real tight around the knees and big in through him. <laughs> that bus stopped and that door said, Ch -ch -ch, and that lady would step up in that bus. <laughs> That skirt caught her and she reached down on that where that zipper was and said, <coughs> and give herself some slack and she tried again and still was too tight. She reached back <coughs> the second time and still wasn't quite enough slack. She reached around a third time, caught that zipper and Ma Sell that better just eased his arms up under her. <laughs> Gently picked her up and walked up on the bus and eased her down in a seat and said, woman, get on the bus, we'll be late to work. <laughs> and the lady drawed back and slapped Marcel right in the face, said, you fresh thing. You get your hands off of me. Marcel said, fresh, said, woman, you just unzipped my britches three times. <laughs> I love you because you're working folks. But the main reason I respect you so much is because you ain't a bunch of pessimists. You know, you, hey, you, you can just get to griping about everything, get to worrying about everything, and one of these days I'm going to work me up a lay sermon about worry. Some of the finest, devout Christian folks I know wave that Bible over the head and say, if God be for you, who can be against you? But a little rain break out in their life, they go to worry, worrying themselves sick. Well, give me them folks that praise God down in the valley and praise God up on the mountaintop. Hey, them's the kind the Lord can use. But I'm telling you, my mama, my mama's 78 years from 79 years old. She told me the other day, she said, baby, I'm worried about sister. She's had this stroke. I don't believe her boy's looking after her. And I've worried about it till I'm near about sick. I said, Big Mama, back when me and my brother Sonny was overseas, I'm told that one day a taxi cab from Macomb, Mississippi brought you a telegram and you opened it and it said your baby boy, Jerry Clow, was missing an accident in the South Pacific. Is that right? I said, that's right. I said, I'm also told that the next day the same taxi driver brought you a telegram and said your son Sonny Clower was missing an action on submarine. Two days, two telegrams, just two boys. Is that right? She said, that's right. I said, how did you stand up under that kind of pressure? She said, baby, I leaned on God. I said, well, hey, won't you lean on God and worry about sister? See, when it's great big, we lean on God. When it's a little bitty, we can get the officers over it. That don't make no sense. The Bible says don't even worry about tomorrow. And I ain't. If I sell one album tomorrow, I'm going to praise the Lord. If I sell a million tomorrow, I'm going to praise the Lord. I've been getting by with that. 
Been doing good. But hey, the most pessimistic human being I've ever known in my life was an old boy named Clovis Ledbetter. <laughs> Clovis Ledbetter. If he shows up around here and wants a job, y'all run him off. <laughs> he ain't got no business living in this community. Now, he's got 10 brothers and sisters, Ardell, Fernell, Raynell, W.L., Danell, Odell, Udall, Marcel, Claude, Eugene, and Clovis. <laughs> now, them first 10, they'll do it. I mean, you, you tell them. Where's the chief? Chief, if they show up, you give them a job. Y'all need to make up a little money for the chief. He's down there with that lieutenant governor. Well, I shook his hand so hard it tore his coat sleeve out. <laughs> See him down there, ain't got on no coat. <laughs> Clovis Ledbetter was so negative, he didn't even want to be a Ledbetter. He is mad about it. He was Clovis Ledbetter. Always wanted to be a log truck. He called him when he was a little boy, Clovis, and said, um, 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 um. <laughs> Go like a log truck. Marcel's brother, Ledbetter's youngest brother, Clovis Ledbetter. His bread wasn't quite done. <laughs> Clovis would get stuck in a mud hole at recess. <laughs> you stand in front of him, he keep mud all over you. <laughs> Put it in reverse. <laughs> you move around him, he'd go front of him. Kick it that way. Clovis Ledbetter never said a word until he's 22 years old. One day he's in the back of the classroom. He done got out on the hard road. He was out and him. <laughs> Miss Mentally Stone, the teacher, said, Clovis, shut up that rocket. Clovis said, <laughs> Clovis Ledbetter never said a word till he was 22 years old. You know what got him to talking? Girls, <laughs> as Lee DeLauda flung a craving on Clovis. <laughs> <laughs> Ugliest female girl woman God ever allowed to be birthed in the state of Mississippi. <laughs> Ugly! Asley had to slip up on the dipper to get a drink of water. <laughs> if Moses had a seen Asley, we'd have had another commandment. <laughs> Thou shalt not be so ugly. <laughs> oh, Clovis, would it? Mad it? Built him a little house out there on Uncle Bercy Ledbetter's farm, and one Monday morning he was out there fixing fence. Digging post holes with a post hole digger, fixing fence. It was the right time of the moon to dig a post hole. That's all right. That's all right. I done told you I love you. I love you even if you ain't cultured as me. I thought everybody knew if you dig a post hole the wrong time of the moon, there won't be enough of dirt to go back in the hole. Now, anybody that believe in that to them stars and arrange your president schedule reading stars, that's dumb. That's rich crap. But anybody knows you ought to kill a hog by the sign of the moon. All right, sit down in your academic excellence. I was doing a show in Myrtle Beach, two shows, Civic Center, TV in my dressing room. 
And before I went on, I watched television. I watched it between the shows, and every hour that fella come on, and he told all of the viewers on that station when that ocean was going to rise and when that ocean was going to fall. High tide and low tide. And if he didn't get on there, he'd run it down at the bottom like a tornado warning. <laughs> High tide, low tide. He let everybody know about that ocean rising and falling. Now, what causes the ocean to rise and fall? The moon. <laughs> <laughs> if the moon can control the ocean, it can suck dirt out of a post hole, too. <laughs> Brand new preacher just moved into the county, didn't know a soul. He'd been walking them dirt roads, visiting folks, trying to motivate them to come to the house of the Lord the next Lord's Day, and he walked up on old Clovis. He said, sir, are you a Christian? Clovis said, no, I'm a lead better. <laughs> preacher said, sir, you don't understand. Are you lost? <laughs> Clovis said, heck, no, I ain't lost. I was born in that house right yonder. <laughs> Preacher said, sir, you still don't understand. Are you ready for the resurrection day? Clovis said, when's that going to be? <laughs> Preacher said, don't nobody know. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. Clovis said, don't you tell my wife. She'll want to go both days. <laughs> Ten miles to the closest post office during the Depression. I didn't have a daddy. My mama was just 17 years older than me. And whatever we did to entertain ourselves had to be something that didn't cost nothing, like peanut boilings, candy pullings, log rollings, rat killings, and coon hunts. Rat killings. Rat killings. I saw your eyes wall back in there. <laughs> If you want to have some fun, get invited to an RSVP rat killing. <laughs> oh, yeah, yes, yeah, so there it goes. Get him from my... Wah! I moved whole cribs full of corn to get to them scouts. One day, me and my brother Sonny was going across the corn crib, moving that corn and killing them rats in a great big old lawn. <laughs> Nasty rat run up my overhaul breeches leg and I caught him right there above my knee. <laughs> He'd scratch and bite and try to get loose, not squeeze him. He'd go, <laughs> eee! I told my brother Sonny, I said, get your pocket knife. Because I don't believe I can back him down. <laughs> and I know I ain't going to turn him loose. <laughs> my brother Sonny called all the way around my hand. That pocket knife, I, I took that old red. And I throwed him to a big old bird dog named Andy, and old Andy said, <laughs> Mama took that patch of cloth and sewed it right back in that hole. That didn't bother me none. That wasn't the first patch on them overhauls. We got through killing that rat, I walked out on the front porch, and I hollered to my next door neighbor that lived about a mile off. Woo -hoo! And he hollered back, woo -hoo -hoo! Woo -hoo -hoo! That meant no. I ain't worked too hard today. Be glad to go coon hunting with you. We met down in the edge of the swamps and turned them dogs loose, and they started sniffing on the ground. Treed five times. We caught five great big raccoons. About that time, I heard a racket. And it's somewhat scared me because my brother Sonny and all the dogs was over yonder, and I heard the racket over there. Well, I had done ordered me one of them carbide lights from Sears and Roebuck, what you hang on your cap. <laughs> but I didn't have enough of money to get the cap, too. <laughs> so 
So I done took me a piece of wire, and I done wired that line to my head. <laughs> and when I heard that racket, I whooped my head around that. Then I brought my light around. <laughs> Beam of that light hit a fella right in the face, and it somewhat scared me. But we was hunting on his place. I said, Mr. Barron, is that you? It's me. I don't mind y'all hunting on my place. Back. I heard the dogs barking, went by and picked up a neighbor. And the neighbor said, let's go down there and see if they'll let us hunt with them. I said, who is your neighbor? He said, John Eubanks. Whew, I like to die. I like to die. I didn't know John Eubanks was in them woods. John Eubanks was a great American. He was a great environmentalist. He was a great ecologist. He was a great conservationist. He was a great game warden. John told us from birth, don't ever shoot no raccoon out of no tree. Give everything a sporting chance. Don't shoot it. Be fair. Take a crosscut saw hunting with you. You tree a raccoon, hold the dogs and saw the tree down. Or either climb the tree and goose the raccoon out. Make him jumping amongst the dogs. Sometimes we'd make that raccoon jumping amongst 20 dogs. But at least he had the option or whooping all them dogs and walking off if he wanted to. That was strictly left up to the raccoon. We went on hunting and old John holler, hey, look, babe, y'all get this picture now. They treed up a huge wheat gum tree. You couldn't reach around this tree. There wasn't a limb on it for a while. Way up there, and I looked around at John. Come on, John, tree's too big. You can't climb that tree. John said, ain't that tree. And all these folks, I can't climb. John got broke in shoes off, got barefooted, took a couple of them squat thrust exercises, <laughs> and he broke and run barefooted and broad jumped way up through the air and popped the bottoms of his bare feet on each side of that sweet gum and then hung his fingernails in that bark and then he commenced to shimmy. <laughs> on up that tree like one of them REA pole climbers. <laughs> Knock him out, John! John got on up into the top of the tree. Whoo, what a big gun. Knock him out, John. John reached around in his overhauls and got that sharp stick and drawed back and punched the coon. But it wasn't a coon. It was a lynx. We called them souped up wildcats. Had them great big tushes coming out of its mouth and great big claws on the end of its feet and that thing attacked John up in the top of that tree. Wow, somebody do something. Well, this thing's killing me. What's the matter with John? I don't have no idea. Knock him out, John. Wow, John got feeling great pain. John knew that we toted pistols and I belt to shoot snakes with. And that thing done tore John's overhaul jumper plumb off, eating him up. <laughs> Whoa, shoot this thing. Mr. Barron said, John, we cannot shoot up in there. We might hit you. John said, well, just shoot up in here amongst us. One of us got to have some relief. <laughs> I love y'all. I got some fine friends in this part of the world. You know, Marcel Ledbetter used a McCulloch chainsaw when he tore up that beer joint. And I've been loving them Porter brothers up there in Shelby ever since. Yeah. And Mr. Cosby, old Harold, he's the chairman of the steakhouse over there in Shelby, and a big old furniture man, is he him? Mr. Cosby, my buddy, well, he must be dead. <laughs> Anybody in here know him? A deep water Southern Baptist? You know him, darling? Tell him that I left here and went to the funeral home. Because <laughs> it's very obvious he's dead if he ain't at my show. Got to be. Unless you police didn't tell him. And that'd be bad. Yeah, is that the one on the right there? All right. I'm some kind of something or another. Appreciate y'all. I'm on your side. 
man. If I ever move from Yazoo City, Mississippi, it's going to be right for Liberty, Mississippi, and I'm going to do that in a month or so. But if I ever move from there, it's going to be up here with y'all. Because if y'all catch a kind of perch and fish, these police been telling me they catch. <laughs> Would any of them police lie about fishing? No. They wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna have to try me some of it. I'm convinced there's just one place where there ain't no laughter, and that's in hell. And I've made arrangements to miss hell. So ha ha ha. <laughs> I won't never have to be nowhere where some folks ain't laughing. You know if anybody don't believe in laughing and they got a scowl on their face and they bound and determined they ain't gonna laugh at nothing. You tell them to go home and look in the mirror and see what all us other folks been laughing at all these many years. Thank you. God bless you. Woo! Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'll see you. And Marcel Ledbetter called me today and I said, Marcel, it's dry. He said, man, we done had so much rain here at my house. The white perch have done eat up my garden. <laughs> hey! All right, Jerry. Well, I wouldn't be in my What's up, Dick? Hey, Don, how you doing? There you go. Can we sign your little buddy? No, oh, I don't worry about who we went. Okay. Where's the camera? We need to. Well, right here is a. Uh, we need to get you out where some more folks can get up in here. Hey, get over, get over here, Eric, so people can get up there and sign. Get that, get that. Get, that, get, that, get, that, get, that, get back to people. How you doing? Yep, you need to. He can get up on sign so that we can get him up and get him. There you go. All right, who's that? Hey, sweetie, where's the camera at? That's what I want. Go ahead. Um, I'm going to get some pictures. 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 Sell me one of them twins. 
He ain't gonna do it. Y'all hurry now. I got to go. Go on. Lay it down right up here, y'all. Lay it down right there, sweetie. There you go. There you go. There you go now, darling. You're doing good. Now take that right there. What you got for me to sign, old buddy? All right, turn around here and let's get it. I got a friend from there who's a pharmacist in the city. Tell you what. That's good. Turn around, man. Face yes, look right at it. Here. There you go. You and this mama? Uh, uh, you okay? Don't get more right. time, you'll both. Good. Hey, darling, how you do? Good, good. Fuck you, you just get it. Look at them cutting them eyes at me. All right. Good. <laughs>